Good evening and welcome. I'm Tracy Lamb, Chief Operating Officer of Space Center Houston, Manned Space Flight Education Foundation. We're delighted that you're here this evening. Another one of our great events, thought leaders that bring in outstanding speakers from the past, the current, and also the future to participate talking about how space has changed their lives and what it's meant to others, and how we can fuel the STEM pathway to advance science and engineering literate community and society. We are an official visitor center of NASA Johnson Space Center and a Smithsonian affiliate, which enabled us to bring these public historic type of information on space exploration artifacts from our collection that we have here. The pre-programmed slides that you saw showed many of our different programs and schedule and activities. We invite you to become a member and become involved. Please consider joining us and, and as our journey as we continue to explore math, science, and engineering, and, and space exploration and science. You can find additional information on our website at spacecenter.org. The countdown is underway to the historic Apollo 11 flight to the moon in July of 2019. In celebration of these anniversaries coming up in this next year in space exploration, we'll be kicking off more than a year of activities around those uh, missions and all that they accomplished. In fact, in the month of July, we'll be um, hosting the Defying Gravity Month here at Space Center Houston and around in our community. Look forward on our, uh, on our website. You can gather more information as all those details get flushed out. This evening, I'm very thrilled uh, that we've got a very distinguished speaker Mr. Glenn Lunny with us. His outstanding efforts have really benefited, benefited space exploration for over 50 years. He is a true space hero and someone who has provided significant leadership for numerous missions. Our moderate, moderator this evening is Dr. John Charles, our scientist in residence, who will formally introduce Mr. Lunny. Please email your questions to thoughtleaders at spacecenter.org. The email address will appear on the screen behind me throughout the discussion. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Charles. Thank you, Tracy. It's uh, once again my great privilege to be here tonight. My name is John Charles, and I am the scientist in residence here at Space Center Houston, and I'm also one of the, the most enthusiastic space historians on staff here at Space Center Houston, and it is for that reason I'm delighted to be here tonight with our, our speaker. Uh, as a lifelong enthusiast, I have the honor tonight of sharing the, the stage with an icon of human space flight, Mr. Glenn Lunny. Uh, Mr. Lunny joined NASA at the Lewis Research Center in Cleveland in 1958, and soon was supporting the Space Task Group at Langley Research Center in Virginia, where Project Mercury was taking shape. As he will describe, his first branch chief was the legendary George Lowe. He engaged in simulation planning, launch and reentry studies, uh, which led to a focus on how trajectory control uh, could be exercised in the, new, in the new Mercury Control Center. This would develop into the role of Flight Dynamics Officer, or FIDO, in mission control under the guidance of the legendary Chris Kraft. In that capacity, Mr. Lunny worked on console in Bermuda, tough duty, uh, for several unpiloted Mercury flights, and then at the Mercury Control Center in Florida for the last three piloted Mercury flights. Then he became a flight director for the Gemini program, and he was the backup flight director for Gemini 3 in Houston while flight control was still in Florida. And then when flight control moved here to Houston for Gemini 4, he was the backup flight director at uh, Cape Canaveral. And then he uh, transitioned here to Houston, and then uh, he led Gemini's 9, 10, 11, and 12. And if you've been keeping track, Gemini 3, Gemini 4, then Gemini 9, there's uh, several he missed, 5, 6, 7, and 8. He was overseeing the flight tests of the Apollo launch escape system at White Sands, New Mexico. You can see a full-scale model of the uh, Little Joe 2 rocket with an Apollo spacecraft on top in our rocket garden next to the Saturn V building outside of here. After that, he was a flight director for Apollo 4, the first unmanned Saturn V test flight. And you can see a Saturn V here at Space Center Houston as well. And then for Apollo 7, the first manned flight of the moon vehicle. And that was discussed here in a prior Thought Leader Series event by Mr. Walt Cunningham back in September. 
Mr. Lunny was then the chief of the flight, Apollo flight directors, and he worked at Apollos 8, 10, 11, 13, 14, 15. Yes, that Apollo 13. Space historian Charles Murray has lamented the fact that Mr. Lunny was barely visible in the movie, but that the world would remember that it was, should have remembered that it was Glenn Lunny who orchestrated a masterpiece of improvisation that moved the astronauts safely to the lunar module while sidestepping a dozen potential catastrophes that could have doomed them. NASA Administrator Tom Paine provided critical leadership during this period, as Mr. Lunny will describe. After Apollo, Mr. Lunny managed the Apollo spacecraft program for the Skylab and for the Apollo Soyuz mission, the first joint flight of the Americans and the Soviets. And uh, that featured the first international rendezvous and docking, which is now a routine feature of our international space station operations. The brand new shuttle program, space shuttle program, created the need for a, a servicing function for payloads from NASA, for, from the Department of Defense and from the commercial sector, which was flying communication satellites, and Mr. Lundy managed that office as well. He then went to NASA headquarters, first as a deputy associate administrator for space flight, and then as associate administrator for operations, before moving back to Houston to manage the space shuttle program itself from its second flight in November of 81 through June of 85. Upon leaving NASA in 85, 1985, Mr. Lundy took a position in California with Rockwell International, the company that built the space shuttle, and he was uh, managing the division that was building GPS satellites. So there's another important aspect of our current culture. In 1990, he returned to Houston as president of the Rockwell Space Operations Company, which employed 3,000 people supporting space shuttle flight operations at JSC, Johnson Space Center. In 1995, Rockwell joined with Lockheed Martin to form the United Space Alliance, USA, to provide operation support for NASA as well as to take over some of the functions previously performed by NASA employees. Mr. Lunny became a vice president and a program manager of the USA Space Flight Operations in Houston, staying in that position until his retirement in 1999. As an industry leader, he has supported the Clear Lake Economic Partnership efforts, and he spent one year as the chairman, and he's also been supportive of the University of Houston at Clear Lake and its developmental planning. This evening, we're lucky to have Mr. Lunny here to share his perspectives on the upcoming 50th anniversary of the first moon landing, as Tracy described to you, by relating his interactions with the three exemplary leaders in the Apollo program. I've already told you their names. They're Chris Kraft, George Lowe, and Tom Payne. <clears throat> we invite your questions for Mr. Lunny at thoughtleaders at spacecenter.org. Mr. Lunny, thank you for being with us this evening. Your career at NASA during the height of the Apollo program and then in the aerospace industry during the shuttle era gave you the opportunity to work with some of the undisputed giants of the early space age and soon enough to become one of those giants yourself in our estimation. Uh, Mr. Lenny, let's start with uh, the person that you mentioned was uh, pivotal, I think, in getting you involved in NASA. The, his name was Chris Kraft. What can you tell us about Mr. Kraft and his role in establishing America's human space program? Well, uh, Chris, Chris was our boss early on, uh, uh, and uh, I, didn't, I didn't know what to make of him at first, but uh, we, we started uh, when, when we were down at the Cape in a control center down there that Chris had uh, conceived of, and it was interesting to go through the process that he had there because we ran... Uh, simulations and uh, we had to get to the solutions for the simulations and it took a while for people to uh, recognize what uh, Chris was doing he was uh, grooming a group of people to uh, operate on end console in, in the space theater and it hadn't been done before and uh, it, it certainly kept us on our toes and kept us very busy uh, and uh, I, at the time, uh, Chris was kind of an imaginative guy, and he sort of, uh, I enjoyed him a lot because he always seemed to know what was over the horizon and what was coming. Uh, as an example, uh, he wrote a paper back in 1959, long time ago, and it has uh, consoles, uh, I don't know if you can see it up there. It has consoles. Uh, 
as they were originally thought to lay out. And uh, the, the uh, use of the control center was to be invented. And uh, Chris had a number of people helping him. And uh, through it all, uh, we ended up finding our way to invent what became the flight control business in uh, Houston. Uh, it uh, surprised us uh, how quickly it took uh, to uh, how quickly it took people to uh, pick up on what we were doing. We had uh, mostly very young people, very young people, and uh, they were not afraid to do what they had to do. And uh, I, I always tell people that they came here to do something that uh, they didn't know was impossible <laughs> when uh, they came here. And uh, they started doing it, and lo and behold, they made it more and more possible every day. Uh, so we had a, a wonderful time with a set of youngsters that were just coming out of college, and uh, uh, they they proved their mettle. Uh, and uh, it was a it was a wonderful thing to watch. It was a wonderful thing to see, and uh, they 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 went on to be legends of their own at various uh, departments and. Uh, and it was fun to see them, their growth. Uh, uh, I would say that uh, at that time, uh, Chris uh, to us was almost a, a, a dominant figure. Uh, he seemed to have the answers for things as we went along. And uh, when we had a dispute or an argument about things uh, and how we're gonna do it and whether it's worth doing or not, uh, or how to do it, uh, it would give us an opportunity to try our uh, hand at debating with him. We, we found after a short while that debating with Chris was a losing proposition, but we, uh, were, we were young enough not to worry about that. Uh, so it was quite a time for us, and uh, uh, we moved into the new control center uh, at, at, down at the Cape. It was, a, it was to us. It was a beautiful place, uh, and uh, we used it to train people, ourselves, and others that came afterwards. And uh, it was a, it was quite a remarkable time. Uh, we we built the control center, and at the time, it was a, it was something new. Uh, we had this control center. Other people in America had control centers, but they were mostly uh, classified. They were within the Department of Defense, uh, and they had some very great control centers. Uh, but there weren't very many in the, in the public area, and the pictures of the control center we had at the Cape caught on. People, people viewed it as a very futuristic kind of thing to be doing, and uh, and that is what we wrote on through the Mercury program. Uh, as as part of that, uh, Chris Chris was a uh, was always interested in how well people were doing. Uh, he had a knack of going around and putting his hand on people's shoulder and uh, being sure that uh, they knew what was going on, they knew that uh, he was backing them, and uh, it was a comforting kind of a thing. Uh, on one of the uh, flights later on uh, in, in uh, Apollo 12, we had um, a lightning strike the vehicle, and uh, it just right after liftoff. And it, it uh, was a frightening event. Uh, and as a matter of fact, it, the frightening part went down as we learned that we could power it back up and put all the equipment back online. And uh, it was flying OK. And we found that the vehicle was perfectly fine to uh, pass the test that we had to go on to the moon. So lo and behold, Jerry Griffin and I, Jerry was the flight director at this time, 
and uh, I was a his supervisor, so I was sort of tending him on his first uh, flight of a launch phase, and uh, it was it was easy to see that uh, we were getting everything back online, and we would be able to make a positive decision. But uh, Chris was concerned that maybe uh, Jerry felt too much pressure uh, on uh, on uh, on having to call it off. And uh, he came over and put his hand on Jerry's shoulder and told him, uh, we don't really have to go to the moon today if you decide that you're not able to do that. And then he walked away. So he left J Jerry with, he doesn't have to go to the moon, but by that time, Jerry and I had just about figured out we certainly could go to the moon. And, uh, and that is exactly what we did. Um, Fun time. Uh, uh, Chris had had another capability that was really something to be admired. Uh, he seemed to have a sense of uh, how to how to get to people and uh, how to explain things. He was a very good briefer. Uh, late in the day, uh, in, uh, in in that time. Uh, we had to uh, figure out what we we're going to do about uh, the uh, uh, missions as as they were coming up in, in Apollo. However, before that time, uh, we had uh, we had to work on the Apollo flights. Um, it was a it was a time when it was uh, uh, a kind of a difficult time. But um, we had a we had a time when uh, the team just had to pull to get uh, the uh, navy to to help them on the uh, landing. The situation was uh, we were planning to go uh, uh, in orbit with the with the third Saturn V manned Apollo eight. And uh, the Navy uh, had not yet committed to supporting us. They had made other plans for it. So uh, Chris uh, was told by the general who was in charge of the DOD support that uh, he needed to go out to Hawaii and talk to the uh, uh, admiral who's the sink pack for the, uh, for the uh, Navy. Uh, actually for DOD, but uh, uh, Chris went out there and he gave a presentation that was uh, very compelling and very good. Uh, he was in a room full of br brass. Everybody there had more stars than you can count. And uh, he was uh, kind of n new to it. Uh, and uh, by this time he had briefed the Apollo 8 uh, mission so many times, uh, convincing people that that's a good thing for us to do, uh, that uh, he fell right into uh, uh, finding himself at ease with the with the admiral. Uh, first thing the admiral asked him is, "Okay, young man, what is your story, and what do you have to say?" Uh, at which point, Chris took over and started to explain what we were trying to do on Apollo Eight and why it was important to get the support of the Navy for the recovery. That's what the Navy was doing on this time. Um, they, they recognized the uh, support that was coming, and uh, in orbit, uh, in, the, the, uh, in the explanation that Chris gave people, uh, he went through a special time with the admiral and told the admiral that uh, he knew that uh, Chris knew that uh, the a Navy had already made their plans. This was coming up on Christmas. So uh, they'd made their plans for where they were going to be at sea and where they were going to leave people, the sailors get Christmas off. Uh, but uh, this that's what made this uh, trip to Hawaii so uh, pressure filled. Uh, the the uh, team out there 
uh, sat down in his big room and uh, the Admiral got asked Chris, okay, what have you got to tell us? Uh, and Chris went through his spiel. And at the end of it, he said, uh, I know that you, we have made your plans for what we're going to do here, uh, but we really need you to help support our mission. Uh, and he gave him the time, et cetera. And, uh, and uh, it was a touch and go situation. But when he finished the briefing, uh, the admiral there said, got up and put his cigar down and said, that's the best damn briefing I've had in a long time. Uh, and I guess he was surprised, but uh, we weren't. Uh, and uh, and uh, Chris was right on top of it. Uh, and uh, he was happy with to say that uh, he would support us. When he got up from the table, he turned to his staff and said, give this young man here whatever he needs to support his flight. And uh, Chris got up and uh, the meeting was over. And it's, it's kind of interesting. I have another story later on about uh, when the boss speaks, at least a boss who's respected, um, it settles a lot of the water. Uh, in this case, Chris just listened to the, the admiral uh, and the, when the admiral said that he could have anything that he wanted and he wanted his staff to provide it, uh, he stood up and left the, that left the room and the meeting was over. So the, the question of what was the Navy gonna do for the um, Apollo 8 was, sat, was saddled uh, just like that and there was no extra discussion. Who was the name of the Admiral? Uh, the name of the Admiral is Admiral McCain, a father of John McCain. And uh, uh, so they, it, it runs in their families. <laughs> so. Uh, and the other thing that was going on with the Navy besides Christmas was that little war in Southeast Asia that they were Southeast kind of Asia. preoccupied yes. with. It was, uh, there was a lot of uh, pressure on them to, to, uh, to uh, keep the Navy open, but uh, keep the Navy free. But they, they went and did it, and they did a great job at it, of course, and, and it was fine. So uh, Chris earned his uh, pay that day, and um, uh, we went on with Apollo 8. And Apollo 8, by the way, that was the flight, I, I'm using shorthand, I'm sorry, but Apollo 8 was the flight where we went around the moon and went into orbit uh, at Christmas time. Uh, and we had a, we had the next day, we had a, a, a kind of a shock to us. Uh, the crew started to read from Renes uh, Genesis. Uh, while they were while they were in lunar orbit, and uh, they did that in such a reverent uh, way that uh, it just brought tears really to the people in the control center. They were very surprised that uh, that everybody felt that way, but uh, everybody that was in the control room at that time, and probably even on well not on board, but they were saying the prayer. Uh, it was a magical moment, uh, and, uh, and, and it was a tough year for America because we started off with the Tet Offensive in Vietnam. Uh, we had uh, some bad luck with uh, assassinations in the country. Uh, we had, uh, we had uh, an election coming up, and the president had pulled him, such Johnson had uh, said that he wasn't gonna run, and uh, we had a, we had a a democratic convention in Chicago that was uh, not much of a convention. It was more of a street brawl uh, with the with the people who were out and the, and the police who were trying to control it. Uh, so it was a it was a grim year, and uh, we even got a notice from a lady uh, somewhere in America, uh, and she wrote to the people in the control center. He says, I know this has been a tough year, but thank you for saving 1968. So uh, that was the way it went when he was in place. Well, Apollo 8 required a new rocket 
Saturn V. Like I say, we've got a Saturn V on display. It's made over made up of parts of rockets that did not fly their intended mission to go to the moon. But you, Mr. Lunny, were the flight director on the first unmanned, unpiloted Saturn V flight. Can you talk a little bit about the Saturn V and what it was like to be the flight director and sort of how we got the, the Saturn V in the first place? Uh, how did we get to it? Uh, let's see. Uh, we had a president who said we we're going to go to the moon, uh, and George Lowe had been one of the people proposing to go to the moon and land. Uh, and it seemed like uh, he then turned around after he said that and asked NASA how they were going to do it, and there was kind of a quiet <laughs> in, the, in the halls. There was no real answer for how are you going to do it. Uh, took NASA about another year to get agreement with all the people as to how to do it. And uh, some fellow at Langley invented something that they called Lunar Orbit Rendezvous. And up until that time, we'd been thinking of, you know, ground up uh, uh, rendezvous. But in this case, uh, and that would have been done in Earth orbit. In this case, we were seeing what would have been uh, a rendezvous in lunar orbit. Uh, and you, you might ask, well, why, what's the big deal about that? Well, uh, when we first started planning to go to the moon, we had a rocket that was estimated to be um, 13 million pounds of uh, weight on the pad to, before it ignited, 13 million pounds. And in the end, we went to the moon with a rocket that weighed six and a half million pounds uh, because of the solutions that we were able to bring to the story uh, and, to the, uh, and to the people who were uh, building the, uh, the launch vehicles. Uh, we were able to open up a large uh, room to, tra to travel in and to perform in and uh, the uh, the uh, lunar orbit rendezvous was uh, very successful. It, people uh, sometimes get, we get too talkative or, and we get too uh, geeky about what a rendezvous is. Uh, if you think about going to uh, uh, New York on the plane on a family vacation, when you get there in this great big airplane, you don't go downtown to the hotel in the great big airplane. You go down to the hotel in something that's sized for the job, which is a taxi cab or a bus or something like that, uh, and uh, made all the sense in the world to do it that way. Likewise, coming back, you call the cab and off you go. Uh, and uh, it, that simulated what we were doing with, uh, the, uh, with the lunar orbit rendezvous. Uh, because what we did was we parked the vehicle that we were going to use to come back to Earth, and we left it parked uh, in orbit around the moon while the crew went down to the moon and then came back up in the little last stage of the descent module, of the uh, lunar module. And uh, it took a while for us to get to that, uh, but... Lunar Orbit Rendezvous really saved the program because it, it was doable. I mean, can you imagine, you think the Saturn V is big as it is now? We were, people were talking about it would take twice the size of it to uh, get the vehicle on, on the path. So uh, we ended up having the first uh, set of fun with uh, the Lunar Orbit Rendezvous because the Gemini program was coming on and uh, we were going to master, that was our assignment, master the intricacies of rendezvous in Earth orbit. And we did that uh, from 1960, end of 1965 till uh, through 66 and up till the end of 66, 1966. Uh, we had an open field to uh, do all the work that we wanted to do on, uh, on rendezvous. Uh, 
we, we did it every way that we could. We did it in some cases because there were abort possibilities at the moon that would create a certain set of lighting conditions. And we even did some of the testing of uh, the lighting conditions were with the, with the Gemini vehicle. And it, uh, it, it kind of stretched everybody. But uh, we had um, a number of crews, six of them or so, go through rendezvousing with the target. And then we had about four uh, re-rendezvous. So when we finished the Gemini, we had uh, experience with 10 rendezvous. And uh, it, was, it was pretty much like we thought. We had a team of people that had worked on it for a good while. And uh, uh, it, was, it was very, very workable. As a matter of fact, we, we got to the point where we were doing some, some bizarre things. On Gemini 10, for example, we, had, we were going to rendezvous with the Gemini 8 uh, a vehicle at some point uh, that was still in orbit. Uh, and uh, we ended up in orbit with a, a Gemini 8, uh, of Gina 8, uh, with Gemini 8, and with a, G a Gemini 10. No, uh, it was a Gemini 10. That's, that's mom's ring, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, we ended up marching around the Earth with three different vehicles that we could maneuver uh, in the same orbit, that is, trailing or leading each other. And uh, I mean, it was just an indication of how far we had come in terms of being able to um, manipulate the uh, vehicles for that. Now, uh, that took us through the, uh, the part of the uh, proving of, uh, of rendezvous. And uh, it was comfortable with people. Uh, and we were comfortable with it. And we were comfortable that we could put the astronauts through that and uh, they could take care of the rendezvous at the moon. Um, uh, th that given, then we, we, I started paying attention to what was going on at Cape, Cape and what was going on at Marshall uh, with building the rocket. And this is sooner or later in there uh, when I was assigned to work on 501, which was the first uh, unmanned flight of the Saturn V. Uh, it was a, it was a big Hummer. It was really big. When we got out of, when we got out of Gemini, we were used to the size of that spacecraft. But when we got to Apollo, I mean, everything about Apollo was big. I don't know if they have any displays up here of the, the VAB, the Vertical Assembly Building, uh, and uh, I mean, we rolled the Saturn V out. And it looks small. I mean, it actually looks small to, compared to the building. But uh, the, the uh, Saturn V was 360 feet high and uh, uh, about uh, uh, six billion, uh, six and a half billion pounds when you put it on the uh, platform uh, for launch and fueled it. Uh, it was an immense, it was an immense thing. Uh, so. Uh, the first Saturn V, uh, and this was not uh, planned this way, but uh, uh, I happened to get the stick for the first one. Uh, everyone thinking that was the difficult one. Well, uh, it was perfect. It flew perfectly well. Uh, then the next one out, a couple of months later, uh, everything that could go wrong almost did go wrong. We had... Uh, we had uh, pogo is a form of vibration that exists in the rocket and uh, can tear the rocket apart. Um, and uh, we had that. We had uh, some engines shut down. Uh, we had some stuff come off the outer shield. Uh, and and uh, we even had miswiring so that when the 
when it, the vehicle sensed that it needed to shut the engine down, uh, it actually was wired to shut a different engine down. So we ended up having two engines shut down because they were uh, miswired. Well, anyway, that mess got unscrambled. And uh, at the time, uh, Apollo 8 was being, uh, well, it didn't come into being yet, but uh, George Lowe was uh, running the uh, program. Uh, and he was having trouble with the lunar module uh, late in uh, 68, late in 68. And uh, the lamb was, uh, was not quite ready yet, uh, and uh, the people didn't think it would get uh, ready to be tested anytime soon. We had planned on uh, a couple of missions with in Earth orbit and then in uh, lunar in lunar orbit, but both of them using the lunar module, and uh, then we realized that uh, it wasn't gonna it wasn't gonna work. Uh, it was gonna work fine, uh, and so we moved the team from the original uh, 501. We moved them over to 502. Same team, same mission, almost. Uh, and lo and behold, all that stuff went wrong, and uh, we had to re fix it. The Marshall guys had to fix it. And they did that in short order, and uh, by, by the ...1968, it was all fixed. It was launched as uh, Apollo 8. It was the one that circled the moon and then went in orbit around the moon, including the reading of Genesis uh, while we the, the crew was there, so it was a it was a kind of a crowning cap to 1968, uh, and uh, it was it was a it was a great thing to see. Um, 19, uh, 1968 Apollo 8 uh, is kind of a special special mission for people uh, and there was a there was a question about uh, how are we going to do this but we felt that once once we got to uh, lunar orbit and did what we did on Apollo 8 the feeling on the team is that we were going downhill to get to the uh, lunar landing flight and indeed we were we we're going down the hill and uh, it made Apollo 8 uh, made the, the opening for uh, what transpired for the rest of the uh, lunar flights. Uh, we, got, we got over that, uh, and we were very confident about the lunar module. Uh, and by this time, the schedule matched uh, the LEM, perform LEM, the LEM availability, and um, we were able to put it together and after Apollo 8, we flew two more missions, one with the LAM, one in Earth orbit, one in lunar orbit, and then we landed. Uh, and uh, it, was, it was a great time. We were, and we felt like we were going downhill. It was that, it was that kind of feeling. And uh, it stayed good, and uh, we got to the landing, and uh, we made history. Uh, uh, so, where am I? Well, let me, let me ask you a question about that. Uh, you, you mentioned it's almost inconceivable for anybody that wasn't there, but you, you make it sound like you all decided that the hard part was just getting to the moon, and I want to go back and drill down just a second on the sequence of Apollo 4, Apollo 6, Apollo 8, 501, the first Saturn V, 502, the second Saturn V, 503, the third Saturn V. You just told us you had a smooth flight on 501, and on 502 there was a lots of problems, some that would have aborted a, a piloted flight. And then the team, your, your colleagues at, at Huntsville, at Marshall, and the team here decided that they understood the problems well enough to fly people on the third Saturn V after the second Saturn V had been so close to a disaster. Can you tell us I was going to say, John. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, it sounds like you love the idea. 
<laughs> I'm, I'm flabbergasted. There, there are, there's, there's chutzpah. There is, I guess. And uh, we were, we were competent, but we were also uh, careful about things. Uh, but that sequence is, you know, written down now. We know it happened. And uh, uh, if we going in, if uh, going in, if we had recommended that, that we do that, uh, <laughs> we would have been laughed out of the office. But uh, when we got there, that seemed like uh, we were on the right path, and uh, the entire team was satisfied that uh, Apollo 8 was the door that was opened to take us to the uh, rest of the testing sequence with the limb and uh, on into uh, on into the history books. Well, uh, you've got ice water in your veins and, and you guys were able to do it. So let's let's uh, talk about the, the second person that, that made a big difference in your life and that was George Lowe. Uh, you mentioned to me that he was your first branch chief at, at Lewis. Can you talk to us a little bit about the role of uh, George Lowe had in influencing you and what he accomplished with his guidance in the program? Well, uh, okay, that's a, uh, George Lowe's a big subject. Uh, he really is a big subject. Um, uh, I, I, when I hired into NASA full time after co-op and uh, as, a, as a new graduate in 1958, George Lowe was my branch chief. And uh, uh, things were moving very fast at that time because uh, NASA was dealing with this, uh, how are we going to do this? And uh, George picked that up and uh, he, he was working out of NASA headquarters. Uh, I, this, uh, let me explain. We, uh, jo we, well, I, when I was at Lewis Center, uh, that, that's where I met George and where I, I would put the work in his unit. Uh, they were doing rocket dro uh, drops uh, off, off of B-57, uh, and the guys at Langley were doing, uh, dro uh, doing lift ups with lift offs with uh, Scout uh, rocket. And uh, they were happy with that, and we were happy with our way of doing it. But um, both of us were getting information on how uh, bodies react to the high heat of reentry. So George was running that outfit, and uh, I, I think we sort of traded seats on the train because George then went off to uh, uh, headquarters and stayed there. Uh, and uh, I went to the branch and uh, grew up through the uh, through the testing that went on there until I moved to uh, Virginia. I moved down to Virginia in about a year uh, after 1958, in, in 1959, and uh, I had big reasons of, of, to uh, come on back to uh, to Houston. As a matter of fact. Fred Hayes used to fly me down to uh, uh, Cleveland, which is where I was before that. And there happened to be a young nurse working in the place. And uh, her name was Marilyn. And, uh, and it clicked. Uh, and the, the pilots are always proud of that. Uh, they worked real hard to get me home. I, 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 I remember... Uh, one time when I was trying to catch the airplane, and it was at, um, I guess it was at Butler Aviation in, in uh, what was uh, National Airport at the time. Um, I got to the, the, the Butler shop, and they said, well, you're too late. Uh, they've already left the station, and they're out getting on the runway or getting on, ready to load out there. And um, uh, the next thing I know, they were chatting with Joe Algrani about it. And Joe said, oh, hell, bring him out anyway. So I went out to the airplane, and, it is, and I, I think about this later in life. This airplane throws open the doors, and this guy gets out of something that looks like a Jeep, throws his bag onto the airplane, and 
they, they scrambled the board with arms pulling them and so on. And uh, it was somewhat, <laughs> it was somewhat unbelievable, but you know, that was the way uh, they got me back to Cleveland as often as I did and uh, turned out to be successful. Uh, but back to George Lowe, though. Oh, George. <laughs> George, yes. Well, George went to headquarters, and, and I lost him. Uh, in effect, uh, I, I didn't see much of him, and I, I was a, just a junior guy uh, a couple of years out of college, so I didn't exactly hear what was going on down in Washington very much. Uh, but uh, George was working on what became uh, the lunar landing goal for the uh, president. And uh, he was one of the early proponents of that. And a lot of people were, you know, they were trying to water it down a little bit less demanding than an actual landing on the moon. Uh, and and uh, he stuck to his guns. And through it all, uh, while NASA was trying to figure out now that the president had spoken, how are they going to do this? Uh, George was, uh, uh, the only way to do it is land on the moon. That's what we're trying to do. And, uh, uh, and that's when the discussion of the uh, Saturn V and what it was going to take. And again, uh, George was uh, on the side of the angels in backing the lunar orbit rendezvous because we were able to get away with the lighter weight uh, lighter weight, six million pounds uh, at uh, liftoff, and uh, uh, it uh, it was a good time. It was a good time, and uh, so I didn't see too much of them then. Uh, I I would hear things, but uh, I didn't I didn't uh, see him very much. Uh, but I saw I felt his, uh, his NASA felt his presence because. Uh, the lunar landing was a long time advocacy position for George. Likewise, uh, the uh, the uh, uh, lunar orbit technique was a means to an end, and uh, George backed that first time from the first time he studied it. He backed that, and uh, it made the Saturn V possible. Uh, it made it possible to do the job that we had to do, uh, and and. Uh, and when uh, we had a chance, we were able to prove that on the, on the, on the uh, rendezvous flights. So it was quite a time. Uh, uh, and, then, and then George uh, came down here after a while in uh, oh, the middle, uh, in the middle of, uh, I think it was 67, yeah, well, yeah, George. George, no, he. George came to Houston as the deputy a couple of years before the fire, uh, and then uh, when the fire occurred, he moved into the uh, job as the, the program manager. Uh, and it's just sort of, kind of amazing. Uh, George was sponsoring the the goal of a lunar landing in uh, in Washington, and he and others, I guess. Uh, convinced the president to sign up for it. Uh, and then the president was able to call their shot, call their play and say, okay, now where's, how are you gonna do that? And uh, George had an answer for that and uh, it took a while to get everybody on board with it, but uh, it, uh, it worked. And uh, it was the technique that we needed to, al to allow the Saturn V to get built the way we wanted to build it. and. You know, the, 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 it's not like trivial to to uh, think about building something bigger than the Saturn V, uh, and we were trying to avoid that possibility. Uh, and even even at Marshall, Werner von Braun was worried that it was getting too big to build, uh, or too big to safely build, or so whatever. Um, so anyway, uh, George kept to his guns, uh, and uh, as I said, uh, he's on the side of the angels on all these issues, and, uh, and then he came down here. 
He was Bob Gilruth's deputy. Uh, Bob Gilruth, one of the unsung heroes of the um, space program. Uh, and and uh, George was at his side. Uh, and then when the fire occurred, there was a scramble about what are we gonna do? And uh, lo and behold, George Lowe was selected to uh, be the program manager. And um, John here uh, gave us some uh, good words about uh, George, uh, but I think people, especially people at this center would know the uh, contribution that George made when he became the pro program manager. He, he had an instinct for things. He knew when things needed fixing. Uh, uh, he was a soft-spoken guy. Some people bang the table a lot uh, and, and do the wrong thing. <laughs> uh, George just uh, brings people in, uh, gathers them up, gets them on his side, and uh, the whole thing works so much better. George had brought the uh, configuration control board idea and really worked it. He took, he had a, a management council of the uh, leaders uh, in the center and the centers. Uh, and uh, they would go on a, they would go on a, a control board tr tour. And I don't know if they did this all the time, but I think once a week they were on the airplane. They were either never going to go from Grumman to further uh, further west, and we've got our contractors both in, from all spread out all the way to California. So it worked okay uh, <laughs> for long airplane rides. And the the like Gulfstream when it was used was. Uh, was a good platform to that George would have to uh, listen to people's discussions outside of the control board environment, uh, and then uh, uh, hold forth on what we should be doing. It was it was a remarkable time, and uh, that went on for whatever it was, uh, uh, probably a year and a half, year and a half, about, and. Uh, and gradually that came to pay off, and uh, here we were, uh, ready to do the stuff that's coming in, uh, in Apollo 8. Um, that was the first big challenge for the team uh, in the Saturn days, uh, in the, uh, the Houston team, and uh, it, it went well. Uh, the flight was beautiful, it went well. And then the flights dominoed on from there, down to the lunar landing flight, which went fine. And uh, when that was all successful, uh, George uh, went back to Washington again. It's like, okay, I figured out how to do that, so you guys can do it again. And uh, uh, George was back uh, in, in a steering wheel job in uh, Washington. And this time he was the deputy administrator of Washington. Uh, he never did make the administrator, I don't know why, but uh, uh, he was comfortable wherever he got put. And, uh, and that's where I ran into him. Uh, uh, I, I had worked with him uh, earlier. I had worked with him on the, uh, on the flights, the, the flights that went on at, in the early days, because I worked about four out of the five flights that we uh, needed to fly before we went to the moon, before we landed on the moon. And uh, it was a it was comfortable time. Um, and uh, George was there through all that until he, until he got moved back to Washington. But uh, I guess I would have to say that uh, a lot of people think that uh, we could not have finished Apollo very well if we didn't have had if we didn't have George Lowe in the job that he was in, he was a he was a champion and uh, uh, he for me I was just I worked with him when I, as a flight director uh, for his flights, uh, but then 
he went back. I eventually got drafted to do the Apollo Soyuz project. And lo and behold, the first guy that uh, comes along from Washington to help us is George. And uh, uh, we went to, uh, a group of us went to uh, uh, Moscow and came back home and decided that we ought to try a uh, space mission with them, uh, ASTP. And uh, so we raised that issue, you know, within a week or two of uh, coming back from uh, Russia. Uh, when George heard about it, uh, he decided that he needed to test the waters. So he went over there and tested the waters and everything was fine. Uh, they were willing to try to talk, willing to try to go ahead and have conversations about it, um, see what uh, see what they could do. Um, it was uh, it was kind of a strange time for me. Uh, you know, when Chris called me up and said, "I want you to get ready to take a trip," and I said, "Okay, where am I going?" And he said, "Well, you're going to Moscow," and that's before you guys have been over to Moscow a lot from here. Uh, but in those days, it was a little harsher environment. Uh, and uh, by the way, in the middle of ASTP and uh, Apollo Soyuz, uh, there was a war in, between, in the Middle East between the Israelis and the, and the um, uh, Palestinians in, in, in the, uh, in the, over the, uh, what, what are we going to do with this thing? And uh, th there was a, quite a time when it was going on. Uh, we put uh, the f faxes that we got from home, we put them up on the wall in our area. And it was interesting because the, the Russian guys would come by and read the faxes and the twixes that we had from uh, the American side, the American point of view. And uh, uh, it was time to get comfortable. Uh, and so anyway, uh, that was fine with George. And uh, he was always sort of there. Uh, that, there's a picture of him at a table. Uh, I, I, that, I believe that's the FRR paper that he's signing for the Apollo Soyuz flight. Uh, George came over there with us. <laughs> But we, we, uh, I was sitting in here not aware of the following. I was not aware that uh, NASA headquarters had uh, offered to put the performance of a mission with the Russians on their Salyut on the presidential summit agenda. And, and then 15 days, uh, I mean, uh, in the middle of, yeah, about 15 days before we had to start working that through with the, uh, the people who were controlling the agenda, the, the president's agenda. So we had a short fuse to uh, figure out what else we needed to do. And we had been working on it, but we hadn't been working on it like the president is going to ask us whether we should do this or not. Uh, and uh, lo and behold, Basically, that was the question that we were asked. Uh, can you guys do this? Can you get the communications you want, et cetera, et cetera? And at that time, we were nowhere near where you guys are today. Um, and just to make the point, uh, we, the communications were bad. We don't, they didn't want to use the phone, and et cetera, et cetera. But um, we scheduled a meeting to go over there uh, because we wanted some answers. We wanted to see what what had been an ongoing running problem with them in terms of agreeing to uh, the communications that we needed. And uh, so, so we knew that we had some open issues. But when we went over there and we did it in a way that was uh, uh, clandestine, I guess you would say, uh, I think Marilyn knew where I was going, but very few other people did. Uh, uh, and um, over we went, and we we run into this. 
uh, on the first meeting, first discussion, the Russians come out and say, we've changed our mind. We're not going to do this with, on the Salyut mission, Salyut vehicle. They just launched it a year before that, and so, or less. And uh, they, were, they had decided afterwards not to offer it. But they didn't tell us that. Uh, so we were going over there on the assumption that we were going to work on the Salyut, which is a kind of a small space station, uh, bigger than the Soyuz, which is the spacecraft itself. Um, and uh, so they had backed out of it. So, you know, and then they offered to do it with the Soyuz. So George asked me what I thought of that. So I went and there and uh, we did what we do. And I ended up coming back to him and saying, the Soyuz will be good for all the objectives that we had with Salyut. As a matter of fact, I was a little relieved because we knew a lot more about the Soyuz than we did the Salyut. Uh, so for me, after I got over the shock of them not telling us what the problem was that they were wanted to talk about, uh, that uh, uh, it took a while. Uh, anyway, they, uh, the Russians kind of came around. George, uh, George was very good. He had this uh, relationship with Mr. Kissinger. Uh, I wasn't in the room for some of this, but uh, Kissinger, I, I, I learned from others who were there. Uh, Kissinger told George, uh, Dr. Lowe, he says, I, I don't know anything about this space stuff, but if you decide you like it and you want to do it, fine. If you decide it's a rigmarole and you don't want to get into it, that's fine too. You call the, you make the call, and I will back you. Now, I mean that's quite a thing for the United States government to be doing, but uh, uh, that was the way it was. And uh, hell, they had me for the program manager, so <laughs> you know they were doing crazy things. Uh, uh, before we before we uh, go too much further in that direction, and we do want to take some questions from the audience, but there's I think there's one point you wanted to make about the third figure that I introduced, and that was Tom yes, Payne. Tom Payne. Can you say something about the leadership of Dr. Yeah. Payne and how it influenced what you all were doing? Uh, Tom, uh, Tom Payne was a relatively quiet administrator in terms of interaction with those of us out here. Uh, but he, he had always supported the uh, cooperation with the Russians, by the way, and other uh, internationals. Uh, uh, but uh, he came down here on an airplane with George, I think, George Lowe. Uh, George was the deputy and Tom Payne was the administrator. and. Uh, they came down together uh, after the Apollo 13 had blown up. And I came on duty after it had blown up, uh, about an hour after it had blown up, and spent the night working on, OK, what are we going to do? Uh, and we ended up deciding to keep the platform up uh, and, and keep it up so that we could make a reasoned decision to uh, either shut it down or Keep going. So by, by platform, you mean the navigation system? The navigation guidance system. So uh, I decided that that was the best thing to do was to keep it up. Uh, the the uh, calculations of how far we could stretch the electrical power uh, and uh, so on. Uh, you know, you can be very very conservative about that, or you can be more realistic. And the more realistic answer was that. We could uh, power the vehicle. We could power it up and take a burn when we get around the corner of the moon, and go around the corner, uh, and uh, that is that we're on the way back home, uh, and then we could power it down. And that would leave us quite a while to save on the power. Uh, however, as a, as a measure of how uh, how <laughs> conservative we were. Uh, when we got to the end of Apollo 13, uh, we had we we turned the uh, 
all full power on. We put all the guidance system back up uh, and we got ready to use it uh, for entry. But we deliberately did that because the spacecraft had been cold. I We were not really quite aware of the uh, situation with uh, one of the crew that was really suffering from the weather uh, in the vehicle. But uh, uh, the, the, it, that was our source of heat. When we powered it all down, the spacecraft gets kind of cold. Uh, but uh, uh, when we, for the last eight hours, we could pressure, uh, pre uh, press it up and, uh, uh, and we used a lot of the fuel uh, so that uh, uh, the, uh, we lose a lot of the energy out of the batteries. Uh, you said, but, you told me there was one specific incident that Dr. Payne oh, yeah. weighed in on. I'm getting it to made that. a difference. So, <laughs> I, I'm slow, John. Uh, so, uh, so, John, uh, so the, Dr. Payne comes down and he comes down on the airplane. So, uh, I get to tell him all about what uh, happened the night before, although we didn't know what really caused it. But we described the conditions that we were dealing with. Uh, we described the options that we had, and I and I described the uh, options that the option that we liked and the one that we wanted to execute. Uh, and uh, this is how that went down. Normally, in NASA, when you're making a big choice like that, you get a lot of help. Uh, a lot of people <laughs> want to weigh in and tell you what you should do and so on. And that was. I, Jerry and I, Jerry and I, Jerry Griffin and I went down to do this briefing, which Chris sent us down to do. He was smiling when he did. He said, "Get on, get on, tell him." And uh, anyway, uh, when we got to the briefing with uh, Dr. Payne, we went through our spiel, and uh, Deke asked a question, and then I answered it, and then. I looked, at, you know, I looked at Jerry because this is when the, usually the horde is unleashed. But in this case, uh, Dr. Payne said, thanked me. He interrupted. He didn't let anything else go on. He said he thanked me for uh, the briefing. It gave him a better ground for listening to the problem. Uh, and uh, he had a better understanding of what we were faced with. But when, when, uh, when he, when he got done with that, he said, I really only have one question for you. And I looked at Jerry and I was thinking, boy, what's that going to be? And he said, what can we do to help you men? That was the administrator. And uh, I took it literally and you know, answered it literally. Uh, like, well, we've got everything we need and if we think we need something else, we'll ask for it, and so on. Uh, but he, what he was really saying is, you're my guys, I'm going to go with you. And uh, the, the, the horde was returned to its barn <laughs> uh, in terms of uh, what, might be a, what might have been a free-for-all what to do about Apollo 13. But Tom Payne was not with us very long. Somewhere along the line, uh, he, he figured that out. And uh, uh, his question was, what can we do to help you guys? That doesn't occur to very many senior managers to ask that. Uh, but what can we do to help you guys? Well, with that, I would like to uh, uh, thank Dr. Lenny, Mr. Lenny, for, for the, the thoughts. And now we want to turn it over and see if there's any audience questions that uh, uh, Mr. Lenny might want to answer. Thanks, John. Mr. Lenny, when you first saw the Saturn V for the first time, when it was stacked up, what was your thought? And then what, what did it make you feel like? and you're kind of responsible for after it left a launch pad. What was your thoughts and impressions? Well, uh, I mean, at first, it's, it was hard to believe. Uh, I mean, we had to put this thing on a, on a top of a crawler, and then we put a 
platform, the flat player platform that the vehicle stands on, uh, and a big tower next to it uh, to, to feed it. Uh, and it was a little unbelievable to watch the size of this equipment play out. Uh, and uh, I mean, I knew it was going to be OK, but uh, we, we did a test, a countdown demonstration test. You probably still do them. Uh, and they usually take uh, a couple days. Uh, this one took two weeks to do the CDDT. And it was, it was very painful because the guys were struggling with everything. They're, they're struggling with a new set of people, uh, you know, trying to do it. Uh, they're struggling with software. They were struggling with all this stuff. And uh, it took that long to get through the see, two to two, the uh, ten, three day test. Took two weeks to get through it. And uh, anyway, uh, slowed us down. But I have to say that I had confidence the whole time. I had confidence in this team, even if I didn't know them. Uh, uh, I mean, I, I know what they brought to the table. The Marshall guys uh, did a great job with the Saturn V and with other uh, vehicles that we launched, starting with the Redstone. Uh, and uh, uh, it, was, uh, it was quite a time, and there was a lot of confidence in people. There was a lot of trust in people, uh, and uh, I, I was kind of—I was pretty sure that if they said it was ready to go, that it was ready to go, and uh, off it went. And the second time, the second time, somebody else was the flight director for the uh, thing, and it was Cliff Charlesworth. And uh, you know, Cliff thought I did him a real dirty job <laughs> by taking the easy one and giving him the hard one, but. But we learned a lot from that flight. The Marshall guys learned a lot, and they turned that around uh, in a, in probably I think about it was about six or seven months uh, to put the fixes in place that uh, then would support the Apollo eight liftoff later on. How's that? That's great. Any more questions? Yes. Yes. Uh, Mr. Lunny, what was the most challenging decision that you had to make as flight controller? A any particular mission or? No, no. Just in general. No, probably the most demanding uh, thing was what we had to do during uh, Apollo uh, 13 because there was, there was a uh, feeling in the control center that the first thing we should do is shut everything down, turn all the power off, uh, the minimum possible. Uh, we came back on power levels that would light a couple of lamps in your bedroom. Uh, and so uh, they, were, they were willing to do that and uh, shut it all down to there. And we, to do that, we would have lost the alignment on the platform. We would have lost the ability to do a big major burn very easily and uh, successfully. So uh, I was un 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 unwilling to let go of the capability. One of the things we learned uh, in uh, early on was don't throw any capability away if you don't have to. And I didn't feel like I would have to uh, in the circumstances that we had this time. And uh, so but there was a, there was a consternation among people about it as to whether we could we could do it, and uh, yeah we could do it, and we ended up with an extra shift's worth of power at the end of the flight. So uh, I felt vindicated by, by going ahead and using it uh, for a good purpose, which was to get the vehicle accelerated coming back to Earth uh, rather than turned off. Uh, so. That's my answer to that one. Great. Thank you. Mr. Lunny, um, at what point after the explosion on Apollo 13 did you begin to feel the crew would return safely to Earth? Well, I never doubted that we wouldn't. Uh, so I wasn't, I didn't have to correct myself uh, <laughs> back to that as, as the norm. Uh, I, 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 had, I don't know if I had a, 
I had a confidence that we could figure out a way to get them back. And I didn't know exactly what it was, but uh, we'd been through all this lots and lots of times, starting back in that control center down at the Cape that uh, Chris made us go through all kind of exercises just to test us. Uh, and um, yes, we had to stretch ourselves to get, get it back, but uh, I think we played it as well as we could. And we've replayed it all these years. No one's come up with a better way to do it. So it must have been reasonably right. <laughs> the guys who flew, my, flew me home to Cleveland and I got married, they, they got back home safely too in that one at least. <laughs> Fred Hayes. Okay, here's another one. Um. Which flight was your favorite to direct, and why? I, I don't exactly think I have a favorite. Uh, uh, they were all exciting. They were all special because we knew the people who were flying them. Uh, and uh, so, I, you know, I just, I just didn't put... Uh, put a stamp on any one of them as, as the best one or something. But certainly there were some uh, high points. Apollo 13 was one, Apollo 8 was one, Apollo landing was one, Apollo 11. Uh, so they were all high points. But they were scattered in that were a lot of flights that uh, people didn't pay too much attention to, but we had to make work. And we did, and the astronauts also did. and. Uh, there was a potential for any kind of problem all the time as we went along. And, you know, we planned for a lot of things around big events. We'd pay a lot of attention and then uh, it would ease off a little bit like Apollo 13. Hell, we were just putting the crew to sleep uh, at night and shutting it down and it blew up on us. Uh, and so it was it was an unpredictable business and sometimes the failures manifested themselves in very, very ugly ways, uh, and uh, it was, but it was fine. We, we, I, I didn't. I never picked a favorite. Uh, uh, others may have picked theirs, but I, I liked, I liked them all because we, uh, we participated in, in all of the flights, almost all. As a matter of fact, I, in Apollo, I there's one or two flights that I skipped some for some reason. Uh, probably shifting of flight directors around, but uh, but uh, I, I so I missed a couple of flights in terms of actually sitting in on them and being a decision maker. But that was only a few out of you know ten or so that I was involved in. Uh, it was a grand time. Great, thank you, uh, Mr. Lunny. Based on your experience. What do the flight controllers of today need to focus on in order to be successful when taking the first steps beyond the moon? Wow. Okay. Uh, uh, I don't. Th I don't think I could advise them on that. I think they already know what they have to do, and uh, they're. I have the same confidence in them uh, that I did in the that our team and the other teams that were operating on Apollo, uh, I figured they were fine to do what they had to do, uh, and uh, it was going to work out OK. And that's, that's the way it was. So there's a lot of, a lot of folks wondering, you know, with the movie just coming out, First Man, and you know, what people's thoughts were about that movie, who actually got to live during that time with Neil Armstrong and the crew. Um, did, have you seen it, and any any thoughts you had about it? Well, yeah, uh, I saw it, and uh, and some, some of the cockpit uh, displays, X-15, starting with the X-15, were, were, and then into the, into the uh, shuttle vehicle. And, and the Apollo vehicle. But all that stuff was uh, uh, really magical for me to watch uh, 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 because, you know, it portrayed at least a version 
of uh, what went on. I, I must admit, I don't know that everything makes so much noise <laughs> as they portrayed in the movie. Uh, you can't find yourself thinking. Uh, but uh, I had some other things, reactions, but they were sort of they were sort of personal that I just let go, uh, and I would leave them that way. Uh, but it was qu quite a time, and it was, and and they captured they captured the time uh, pretty well. Uh, and um, so all in all, I give them credit for that. And um, it's easy to complain about it, but uh, I give them credit for that. And so no, I'm serious that uh, it was uh, it was good. Uh, but I the personal stuff that was going on. I felt like I shouldn't be in the room, uh, and that was the way. It was just sort of the way I felt about it. <laughs> this is our last question for the evening. So, what advice would you offer for people just starting out in being a flight controller or being a flight director? And I, I know oftentimes that uh, many of, of you all from the Apollo era may go back and and talk to some of the folks there, but can you give us an idea of the, the type of things that you may mention? Well, uh, one, I mean, one thing is uh, uh, do what you can do. Uh, some people have skills that let them do a lot of things. Dr. Kraft had a hell of a lot of skills. Uh, none of us presumed to think that we could develop those ourselves. We all made a shot at it, uh, but uh, we, we all fell short of being as good at it as he was. Uh, so that's okay. I mean, you do it the best you can do it, and uh, that's okay. Uh, and there's a place for everybody. I, I was surprised by that in a way, in that just the way things worked, people seemed to choose the the path that was compatible with their own skill set, and they didn't they didn't set themselves up for failure. They didn't try to do something more than they should. Uh, but on the other hand, if asked, uh, I always said yes to anybody that was asking me to do some kind of job or another. Uh, and uh, some people might feel like their answer might be, well, no, I don't think I can do that. Uh, so, I mean, you got to live with your own sense of what your skill level is and how well you can perform. And you don't want to be letting the team down. So uh, we're all not, we're not all able to operate at the highest possible level. You don't see any George Lowe's around. You just don't see him. You don't see any Chris's around either, although I see him. <laughs> He's still ranting about different things here and there, but uh, well, that be careful. It, that occurs to me. Uh, this is a good point to, to end the, the evening on. I think the le takeaway lesson here might well be distilled into this. Perhaps this could be a, the title of another book, and that would be, If Asked, Say Yes. So for Mr. Lunny, thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you for allowing me to be with you this evening and on top of you. Wow, what a fantastic program. Thank you, Lynn, for sharing your, your evening with us, telling us some about the, the greats of the Apollo era and some of the challenges that you personally were faced with and missions and along with many other flight controllers and what you did to overcome that. It's some great lessons that we learned uh, this evening and we appreciate it so much for you uh, being here. John, thank you so much for helping moderate uh, for this evening. So stay tuned. We've got plenty more uh, activities we'll be announcing very soon. So check out our website, uh, go on our social media. You can also sign up for our newsletter and gain additional information there. Uh, the most important thing is 
you'll see more and more opportunities for public programming, uh, special events that we'll be having. Uh, we hope that you enjoy this. We hope that you uh, let your friends know and your family. If you wanted to go back and, and see some of this that you didn't capture, uh, we did show that on Facebook Live tonight, and it is uh, stored there. And you can go back and take a look, share it with some of your friends uh, also. And uh, we look forward to having you again. Uh, be safe on your travels home, and we're dismissed for the evening. Thank you.